Hey there, welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings Podcast, the podcast for curious professionals embracing the future of business events. My name is Miguel Lamps, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Skiff Meetings. And in this episode titled The Craft of Storytelling, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jonathan Martin, the founder and principal designer at Showtech. Jonathan has guided his talented team of designers, craftspeople, and technicians in the artful delivery of live, high-impact experiences since 1991. Showtech's skilled execution of unconventional corporate projects and bold meetings reflect the team's multidisciplinary backgrounds in theater, opera, fashion, theme park development, special effects, and live concerts. In our conversation, we talk about things like how technology should always be in the background supporting the storytelling. We talk about how the most powerful performances put the focus on the audience. We talk about the magic of theatricality and the willing suspension of belief. We talk about how show business executives need to be involved in both the creating of the show and running the business. And we talk about why we should support each other's crafts to create the best events possible. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation. And if you like what you hear, make sure you check out the other episodes of the podcasts on our website or subscribe through your favorite podcast service. Hello, welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. And today my guest is Jonathan Martin, the uh, founder and principal designer at Showtech. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Jonathan, we've only met recently, but I've learned a little bit about your career and all the uh, impressive events that you've been a part of. Um, but I'd love you to um, tell our audience who you are and how did you get to be you? Wow, that's a wonderful question. Um, first, I guess I should thank my parents for my mom for the how I get to be me side of it. Um, I've always been interested in theater. I started in high school as a, a musical um, musician, played in the marching band, drum major in the high school band, always interested in singing. I wasn't much of a dancer, loved uh, the theatrical space in general, and found that I fit more into the shadows than uh, under the spotlight, if you will. So um, at a very young age, started pushing sound faders and being focused on um, what lighting looks were and the technology behind how stories were brought to light, um, pun intended, I guess, and and um, never stopped. So went right from uh, high school into um, college studying uh, design for television, uh, theater, did every live event I could working in um, uh, ballet, opera, musical theater, uh, from pushing road cases to hanging lights and sound and whatever I could find to make sure that as the lights went down each evening, I was at a show and learning something from it and uh, able to be in that community that was really starting to resonate with me. And um, fast forward now to 1991, quite a while ago, I was a student at San Diego State and had the opportunity to uh, start on this journey at Showtech and uh, have never looked back. So whatever, 31 years later, however long that, that's been, 32 years now coming up to, um, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful journey and uh, uh, very formative to answer your question about who I am and who I've become. Sure. And I, I love what you said there about just going to shows and working in shows. Um, do you remember any particular uh, moments where you realized something like, I don't know, light wise or sound wise, or you realized somebody was doing something that really uh, enlightened you? Like, I guess, light bulb moments from that, those kind of years where you were kind of figuring it out. Yeah, the there have been so many of those um, opportunities to realize that somebody's using a tool in a very artful and imaginative way. And that's always been something that I've aspired to be uh, or to do as a designer as well. And with regards to a moment, I remember very um, vividly seeing Les Miserables for the first time and being just um, amazed at the masterful use of the energy of the sonic environment of the sound and lighting um, and how they juxtapose those things with the scenic treatments. And to me, it was more about the balance of those things, all of which very powerful and the best of everything available. But none of that mattered because it came together into this um, historical setting and, and supported its story in such a magical way that I stopped thinking about technology, but was impressed by the environment that was created by it. And that's something that we still long for today is we want to use the latest, greatest technology, but we want it to be almost invisible at some in, in some capacity and serve 
primarily to tell that story. So um, first U2 concert, I mean, I have all those checklists that we all have as as young people. Um, when Bono picked up a par can at the time, you know, he's down. It was the boy tour, I believe. Um, I was working as a stagehand at the time and remember that he picked up this par can that he had gloves on and he he was the, the light operator and he was shining it across the front of the audience in a way that um, made the audience the hero of the story, not the singer, the hero of the story. So um, that was definitely that Kodak moment if there if there was one. Um, but I, what was so masterful about it is it wasn't a story about the technology. It was how the technology created the story um, uh, or supported the story. Yeah, I love that. And so I want to learn a little bit about Showtech. And I wonder if that's part of how you think about Showtech or your, your kind of mission when you started Showtech. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like storytelling is definitely something important to you. Yeah, that's always been there. Um, we uh, saw an opportunity to um, kind of fill a niche uh, missing link, if you will, in the industry at Showtech. And the fact that we were a group of theatrical crafts people, um, but also had people come in out of the musical space, out of the corporate theater space, out of the traditional theater space, out of the dance, opera, ballet space. And all of those different points of view seem to be very valuable from a listening perspective. So while we had this desire and we knew that we belonged in the shadows, you know, the men and women in black, if you will, um, that we were our destiny wasn't to be the performer, but to support the performer. We saw that opportunity to take all of these backgrounds and opinions and experiences and bring them to the corporate uh, events and meeting space in a way that uh, was similar to how we approach the more traditional theatrical crafts. Um, and in doing so, it was always primarily about listening, but then bringing the right tool to amplify uh, those goals and objectives um, in a way that was corporate friendly, in a way that made sense from a fiscal uh, and a financial standpoint for corporate events to be put together. So we were taking what sometimes Times is taboo in the traditional theater, which is being focused on the enterprise value, if you will, or based on the value of the investment that our clients are making in us and making in our group um, as a provider and making sure that that show technology, if you will, which is the amalgam of our name, um, is um, furthering the mission of the business and furthering the mission of the story such that we can bring value. Our niche, if you will, really came down to being a sole source provider. And it took us a long, long time to do that. We started as a group of designers and draft tables at the time we were drawing by hand. Uh, we then went on to be find it difficult in, in our market to find certain suppliers for certain types of work. We didn't really fit into anybody's cookie cutter um, uh, envelope, if you will, with regards to um, being able to pick up the phone and say, look, I need a set for a fashion show, or I need a stage to launch a Pepsi product, or I need this or that. So we quickly became our own scenic entity. So we opened a shop down the street from our design group that became scenery, uh, our scenic shop, and started fabricating our own scenery to help dimensionalize those stories. We then went on to um, add lighting, sound, video, staging, special effects over the course of the years now. And now um, we are a complete show technology group here in our studios um, with all the designers and know-how in the front offices, all the trades people and craft people um, in the um, warehouse and studio spaces that are fabricating, prepping, deprepping, repairing, you know, um, and bringing all of those pieces together, getting them on the trucks, which we also uh, manage for risk reasons. Um, and getting them to the show site. So our niche basically was being able to make a cohesive promise to our agencies, planners, and producers, and in a, in a lower risk way, deliver on those because the assets are held here closely. They're only used for our events um, and they're under our control for the entire time from thought to delivery. Fascinating. Um, how many people work with you now? We have about 25 people full-time here and about 100 uh, permalancers and, and freelancers that we work with. Uh, sometimes much more than that. Um, but our core group, I would say, is about 100 folks um, that are working on uh, on the shows. And uh, the beauty of it is that we are as elastic as we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, and we can be quite small and nimble when we need to be. And when we need to do the large shows, uh, we have a lot of people that we depend on, a lot of talent that have been in our ecosystem for years. Uh, and they feel just like part of our core family. So I just want to stay here for a little bit longer because I want to make sure our audience understands kind of all of the different aspects of your work. Could you give me an example of, in your starting days, uh, maybe a job that you did, the, sort of a typical job, uh, you know, the client, what you did for them and what the end result was, 
and then contrast that with something that you've done recently that's kind of, I guess, you know, larger or different scope that, that involves the different parts of, of your company? Yeah, one of the fun things that we got to do in the early days were fashion shows. So for a major uh, domestic retailer, we had relationships with the um, producers that were on staff with these brands and needed to launch their new lines with major designers in multiple markets. So we would work with the fashion department, which used to be a thing, um, to do these um, trunk shows uh, and or in market um, uh, shows of some kind. And it was really the the ask would come out as we would be in a store. Typically, we would be clearing out the racks. We would be bringing in a set and staging. It would be our job to work with the fashion designer and the brand's designer um, the, and the store's designer um, to make sure that we were showing that fashion in the light that the designer saw it in, both you know light figuratively and literally. But we would also um, have to put together soundtracks. We brought all the lighting. We brought in the stage physically. Uh, we built a set on the stage. We would bring in all the necessary effects. Uh, we would work with rental suppliers that were bringing in chairs and furniture and uh, all the other elements as well. So ShowTech specifically was responsible to turnkey the show technology piece of it, lighting, sound, video. Um, at that time, we were doing a lot of scenic projection uh, and special effects. There was always a gag. There was always some wow factor moment uh, with regards to fog, smoke, haze, uh, water, um, air compressed effects, things of that nature, particulate effects. Uh, so that was a very fun turnkey um, all night experience for us. One long day started um, the minute the store closed. We did the show the morning, uh, the next morning, worked through the night and then took it all away. And they were selling things after lunch on, on, on the following day. We did dozens and dozens and dozens. I lost track of those all over the country for all types of different big retailers and um, fashion designers. So that was, those were a lot of fun in the early days. Um, asking me to fast forward to something that we do now, primarily focused on corporate meetings and events. Uh, it's a very uh, heavy blend today towards the meetings. However, through the course of our history, um, there's been a lot of events in there too. We would typically be doing the general sessions primarily. And then every once in a while, the client would ask us to bring some design ideas and production support out to the final night event or a street party or um, one of the off property events or turn the general session into uh, some type of themed or a celebratory event or awards event of some kind. Um, so the, um, by contrast, now the events tend to be much larger. We would fit everything in one truck and just, you know, send a small crew out. Uh, now it's not uncommon for us to send, uh, multiple semis, um, out to, uh, create these experiences for the planning community and for the, our, our producers and, um, agencies. That's really, yeah, I, 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 that paints a much better picture for me. Um, and are you mainly kind of focused now on the corporate side? Cause it, pays better. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound reductive, but in some ways that, that, that's sometimes the, the way the business works, right? We are, we are focused on corporate customers and we we do so because it's, it is our, uh, it is our niche. There are a lot of people out there that are focused on music festivals and ticketed concerts and um, events. You know, we were, we have done a lot of events. We were an events company uh, for about 10 years during our existence. We had in-house decor, linens, florals, um, properties, departments, and things. And we came to realize that uh, we weren't able to kind of meet our sustainability objectives with those things. Every Nobody wanted to see the same thing twice. We weren't able to establish um, these kind of modular reusable components. And we started realizing that both from a CapEx standpoint and from a degree of waste standpoint, that that part of the business was not uh, scalable for us. So when you take that kind of the, the high concept private events and the high concept corporate events, you know, in the days that it used to be responsible for the corporations to throw big, big parties. And I know some of them still do. Um, uh, we realized that what we really were best at was establishing these uh, theatrical experiences, was dimensionalizing these experiences into these general sessions. And uh, we decided as we grew uh, into our skin that that's what we were going to hang our hat on and and uh, we were going to focus our growth on. Fascinating. You mentioned sustainability. Let's let's go down that road a little bit. It's always a topic that I enjoy discussing with our guests. Uh, we are in an interesting industry that obviously has a lot to learn or has a lot, a long way to go when it comes to sustainability. 
But you've already mentioned quite an interesting factor, which is this idea of, of reusing, uh, which is you know probably one of the most ideal things that you could do in this space. If you can build something and use it multiple times, you're by default saving a lot of resources, right? How do you approach sustainability? And is that something that's, that's, it sounds like it's quite important in your work, but I'd love to hear your take about it. I appreciate that. It, it is, and it's not just because it's a sales or a marketing environment. We as you know, members of our production community for a long time have focused on um, how can we use things in multiple ways? How can we build things in a modular way? It comes out of the theater out of the need to, you know, have something be a staircase one day and a, a wall the next day to, it became uh, financial or it started as a financial objective, but became more altruistic as you, as you move forward. And then those two things converged again, and it starts to make business sense as well. But uh, you, you hit on, I think what is the core of it is we make um, uh, responsible investments in technology and in assets that have multiple um, applications. So wherever we can, um, buy or invest in, in something that's a durable asset and have a high degree of reuse, we're inherently very, very low waste in those capacities. Um, when we build stair units, we build them to known sizes that meet codes in different areas so that we can use them over and over and over again. We use materials that are recyclable in those in those ventures when we fabricate those pieces. Uh, soft goods in those in those capacities, we're mindful of you know what those dynamics are and and are are striving to use those uh, over and over as well. The technology you have to use over and over again, based on the cost and what the community can afford to lease that technology from us. Uh, you have to make good choices as a designer and make sure that those paintbrushes, if you will, are able to function in many different ways through the course of the design. And the fact that the designers are on our team as well, we learn to paint with our toolkit uh, in ways that don't look the same every day by any means and leveraging uh, the newest technology that allows for us to be very amorphous in terms of how we can utilize that same piece of gear in different ways um, really is the core of our sustainability program. While we're mindful of um, salvage and waste and um, you know any toxic materials or anything that we have very low contact with in our in our facility, um, we're really, really focused on making sure that we maintain to a high degree of um, uh, integrity the uh, the quality of the equipment that's being brought out so that customers can rely on it to work um, over and over again. Um, and then when it's time to retire that, find a responsible um, partner to move that equipment to a different level and then replace that with new technology. So it really does center around um, that high degree of reuse. Okay. And, and what about going beyond uh, the waste element side of, you know, the, the ecology yeah. side of sustainability in terms of social or any other area? Um, do you have any norms or any kind of uh, things that you work with with your team and the people that you work with uh, where you take that into consideration? Well, we do um, make available anything that we aren't going to be able to reuse, something that was purpose built for a launch or an activation. And we make those available to local charities and theaters. Um, we, we like the educational dynamic of that because there's a lot of story left in a lot of these pieces that we no longer need. Um, and, uh, so we, we very much like that. We like the architectural components of things. Things can be reused, um, for shelters and ADUs and things of that nature. We make those available to the habitat type, um, uh, local contractors as well. So we like that. Uh, one of the things that we didn't really touch on before in terms of waste is there's other types of waste rather than stuff in landfills. Um, if you look and, and zoom out a little bit, you look at the fact that some of this new technology allows for us to use less space in trucks, therefore less fuel. It's a high degree of efficacy. It's a better energy um, environment. It's lighter weight. It deploys quicker. Two or three lights can be replaced by one new, smarter, more capable fixture. So that's less labor. Um, that's less labor that needs to um, commute. That's less time. That's less time the air conditioning has to be on in the venue while we're loading in. That's less time the lights have to be on. Our footprint by efficacious design and by the fact that we control our, our production ecosystem really allows for us to take a very, very holistic picture at what is our footprint for this event. In, in addition to where do the forks and plates go, which are not part of our, our domain, um, we're focused on what energy, what uh, effort, what uh, superstructure was necessary for us to exist in. And did we make a responsible choice on behalf of the client's story and on behalf of, you know, the environment that we're invited to design in? And that's something that we take take very seriously. Thank you for sharing that with us. 
wanted to talk a little bit about your role currently because um are you uh are you still do you still work on the projects and how do you work on the projects because obviously being busy and having a big team and having all these freelancers uh it can be more of a management role but are there areas that you that you're still involved in and and what do you prefer which areas do you prefer to be involved in um i'm very much um in show and business so it is two words something i share with my my family and my my kids as they grow um, is that there's two words in show business and both of them are an important part of what we do here. So while I do spend a fair amount of time on the business, I spend the lion's share of my time in the live show space. So I guide my team in the creative direction of my team as well as support their creative directions um, as they take shape into these designs that represent these you know, 150 to 200 shows a year that we're doing. Um, so while I'm certainly not in the weeds and, and touching and making um, uh, decisions relative to every part of every show. Um, the spirit by which we've created this company is something that um, is surrounding us. Um, and the, uh, the traditions that we've created here are something that, you know, we take very seriously at Showtech and uh, I am the steward of those things. So it's my job to make sure that we're doing things in the way that is consistent with the promises we've made to our customers. And um, that at the strategic level, the art and business of Showtech um, is whole and that the promise was whole and that we uh, will continue to support and bring a good value to our customers, um, regardless of the types of needs that may or may not be consistent with uh, what we do or what we did yesterday. There's a lot of nimbleness, if that's a word. There's a lot of flexibility required mm -hmm. in um, how we use this toolkit to dimensionalize and create this sense of place that um, you know, feeds that desire for us to create these events. So when it comes to storytelling, um, we've touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to kind of build on that a little bit more. You mentioned working with a lot of corporate clients. Um, some clients have great stories to tell. Other clients might be a little <coughs> bit more, I guess, standardized or a little less, uh, less storytelling focused. Could you take us through um, your process or how you work with clients to really get to the bottom of those stories and enable you to then tell those stories or help the clients tell the stories, if you will? Yeah, it really is more the latter. One of the things we don't do at Showtech is we don't write scripts and decks and uh, we don't really create the words or pictures that are delivered from the environments we create. That's that's a different skill set and one we depend heavily on, the playwright, if you will, or the storyteller. Once that those objectives are, are met, whether it's a sales meeting or a product launch or a training of some kind, a compliance meeting, uh, all of those stories, if you will, close quotations, um, take on different amplification requirements. How um, dramatic and how impactful do they need to be packaged in order to be um, memorable? So one of the things that we always do first, and it seems fairly obvious, but rather than saying you need two speakers, four lights, a stage, two screens, and 200 chairs, we really look for opportunities to say, you know, where does this brand belong? Oftentimes for a lot of these companies, especially now in the new work style, it's the only time they're in the corporate ecosystem or architecture is at these company meetings, you know, at these gatherings, at these festivals. It's the only time your customer in mass is going to come be a part of your brand. So one of the first things we do from a story perspective is we try to explore where does the story belong? Where physically and dimensionally does the story, should it exist? You know, and even if it's in another rectangle, in a rectangle, at a, you know, in a rectangular block, in a rectangular city, right, where most of these convention centers are, there's very artful and inventive ways to gather uh, around this campfire and to create this sense of dimension around the messaging. And if the messaging is sell more widgets, or let's succeed together, or you know, please remember that XYZ needs to be done before you can sell financial products to XYZ. All of those things come down to being able to gather focus, being able to make sure that uh, this one on some relationship that one or two people presenting to hundreds or tens of thousands of people is, is understandable to the audience and is amplified and visualized and dimensionalized in a way that is digestible to the audience member. You know, it's way back to the craft of theater again. One of the reasons we use these goofy words like theatricality and story and, you know, all, all of these, you know, sense of place, these are all theater terms. These are places where 
that willing suspension of disbelief, you know, I'm going to put my phone down, I'm going to listen, I'm going to get something out of today's conference. It all begins with that craft of theater in our mind. And while we know that it, we can't put too much frosting on a, you know, on a thin cake, if you will, it can't be all about technology for technology's sake. And it can't be all this amp goes to 11. I'm just going to crank it all day long. We have to follow that heartbeat and energy of that story. And we have to find ways to, take the important parts of it and make these big moments with our clients and make sure that the audience understands it's a big moment and just insist that they understand why. And that why leads to the, what, what you take away. And that takeaway for us is the success of the story. Were you whistling the song when you left? Were you excited about um, the fact that there's a new compliance piece that may not always be the most exciting thing, but were you excited to be in the room of people that that understood that it was important to the business and that we support that business, that business can support us. It's that sense of togetherness and the why we gather, I think, that is so critical in our industry and I think sometimes gets a little bit lost to the logistics. Um, and, you know, we are so excited to be in that shadow between, okay, the convention's confirmed and now what is it? What is the it? You know, why are we gathering? Is it the coffee? Is it the hotel? Is it the signage in the lobby? Or is it our sense of togetherness? And and how can we do our part in that very capable team of planners and producers and agencies to make sure that when they give us the throttle and those house lights come down, that we have them, that we have that message and that we're going to drive business forward uh, in a way that's responsible and theatrical such that people are willing to you know, be edutained, if you will, to, to quote a Disney term, I believe. You mentioned um, that idea of not having a storyteller, or that's not something that you do. It does sound like it's a lot of what you need to happen before you do the part that Showtech does. Um, do you, uh, if you sense that the client, you know, booked a convention, has a, a sales pitch, but hasn't developed that storytelling, do you then kind of outsource that or work with people that can help the clients achieve that? Are, are you, you know, do you push back in that, in that way? We do. We, um, uh, the, the theatrical community is exactly that. It's a community of talented folks that can work with uh, each other very, very well and, and help sometimes answer questions that our clients don't know how to ask us. Um, so if we sit down at the initial discovery um, through the RFP process and realize that, um, look, we really want to do this and they can't identify the this, then we're going to put some talent on the team, introduce them to people that are in the this business. Well, we're in the it business, they're in the story business, and um, we we go to the people that come to us. So we, you know, one of the nice things about being around for as long as we have been is we've had the opportunity to work with hundreds and hundreds of different work environments. And uh, we know the folks that fit different environments and we're, we're very quick and very open and very transparent about, hey, this is not our core business, but we have a friend. Can we you know, bring um, them in and let you see if they're a good fit? And uh, we work together with those folks. So, and that's true of, of all of the things that we, that don't happen in our room as well. It's just as important to have that teamwork spirit you know, I can think of all these pre-cons that we go to where there's 50 people at these giant convention centers of all these different things and realizing that it's as important for the people that are on the janitorial team to be in sync with what we're doing as it is for the security team and for the production teams. And um, one of the things I love most about this business is the, the um, interconnectivity of all of these seemingly disparate entities having to really, really jive in order for that that show to be everything it needs to be. Yeah, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. You mentioned already a little bit this kind of, um, or, or you've mentioned technology, you've mentioned the the digital world, if you will, or all the tools that can help put on a show. You've also mentioned props and scenery and theatricality and all these, uh, I guess, more analog or more artistic uh, side of the business. How do you see that balance? Because you know you mentioned um, better lighting, better equipment. You can be more efficient. You can do much more with you know a single tool. Uh, but there is a tendency, I think, at least for planners, to assume that oh, it's much easier now. The technology will solve things. Will do things like that. How do you see that balance working out? And do you have a a, a view on how to keep it in balance in some way? With regards to the under use of design and the overuse of technology or vice versa, is that the core of the question? Yeah, I am I'm, I'm guess I'm 
I, the core of the question is really technology, right? Is technology the magic bullet for everything? How do you balance that out with the not technology part of the business that you do, which I assume you also think is important? Yeah, of course. Uh, that's a great question. It it really it becomes a reflection of the client's business modality. Uh, are they in the wow business? Are they in the subtle business? Are they in the heartfelt business? And and one of the things that took us a long time is that just because we have these things and we know what they do, that the way we think we should use them is appropriate for those things I've just described about the client's heart rate and the business and and what causes their um, uh, community to to thrive. So it really does come down to listening for the balance. I think like a chef might listen and look for relationships between salt, fat, acid, and, and those types of things. We are also, as a design team here internally, listening for the right mix of those um, kind of analog moments relative to slow, you know, traditional storytelling and those big wow factor moments that we talked about earlier where this is, you know, this is the big... Uh, finale, and this is the big part of what we do. So it can be technology forward in the mix. Uh, technology can take more of the hero role there. But in general, we tend to, I think, lean more towards that transparency component where the technology is necessary and and facilitating that environment and that sense of place and that story, but it's not the hero for those things. So I think we may be on a little on the conservative side in that capacity and not just wanting to flash lights in your face and play overly loud music and, you know, light up the pyro in the first three minutes of the session. We use all those things and they are in our toolkit. But for me, it's about the marriage between uh, when it needs to exist from a story perspective and when it needs to be invisible and just allow for the story uh, to wrap around the audience in a way that they weren't expecting, that it surprise and delight when it needs to, but then get out of the way so that if one person, again, is talking to 10,000 people, all those people know where they should look, make eye contact with that person, listen to what that person has to say, because we're not distracting them with things that are not core to that message. So there isn't a formula for that. We have... Um, best practices that we follow here at Showtech to try to lead people through the funnel quickly and efficiently from a um, difficult questions to wonderful execution journey, if you will. Um, but there is no one size fits all. And, and it really does come down to applying our business knowledge uh, and all these shows that we've done to somebody who we don't yet understand their need for how we, they'll consume what we do and finding the blend between those two you know, poles, if you will. Could you give us an example of these best practices or maybe just a general thing or anything specific that, that you're looking for when you kind of make those decisions? We are looking for uh, logical choices. So we are looking, and this is how we know that the business is good for us and it will be good for the business that's seeking us out, is we're looking for an opportunity to create success with the planning community and the producers and the agencies, meaning we have a, a space that makes sense and we believe we can execute on. We have uh, the time necessary to execute, not, not, oh, we need more time. You know, we all know that time is tight, but we have the time necessary to make good on the promise that was made to the customer by us and by the agencies. And then um, we're looking for the opportunity to see that what we do, if it is successful, will move the needle for the business. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, when we decide to onboard or not onboard an opportunity, we have to believe that we can be make a difference in their business. We, if we're not, then it's then we're not you know codependent, if you will. We don't need each other to succeed, and we we our best practice centers around exactly that. We need to know that um, you are driven as a customer to execute at the level that we want to deliver for you, or we might not be the best fit. So the best practices come down to that. We have standards and practices. Those come down to we are going to make the best possible show for the resources that are available every time, sometimes over deliver, um, which isn't always a good business thing for either side of the business. Um, but more importantly, to deliver on brand, on message, on schedule um, in a way that is sustainable and, um, and um, scalable. It does sound like it comes down to that, what you mentioned before, the show business, right? Being both in the show and in the business and having to balance those things out is also quite important. And I think most people think that's myopic, but realize that when we say the the business, 
That's the business of our customers as well. Mo mo almost more importantly, we work for very, very large brands. And if we lose sight of why the large brands need to gather people together and, and communicate with them, it doesn't matter what microphone we used or what version of what moving light with what console we use. It's, it's short-sighted and we've lost its purpose. You know, it's a paintbrush without a canvas and it's just not something that we're interested in. Yeah, you, you remind me of in my previous uh, years as a, as a meeting planner, one of my pet peeves, if you will, working with AV was getting uh, a very detailed um, RFP with, with very detailed kind of equipment lists. And I always would, I would always feed back to, to the tech companies kind of saying, I don't really need to know what, you know, what model light you're using or what cable you're using or which microphone you're using on stage. What I need to know is this is the right microphone to capture that voice, or this yeah. is the right light to light up a room of this size. And I'd never really managed to get through to people that, you know, that the RFPs would always come with these very extensive lists of equipment. And I'm somewhat tech savvy. Tech savvy. I used to be in the music business and kind of had a, a somewhat similar journey. So I, I knew what they were talking about to most extent. But at the same time, I just felt like it was a an unnecessarily technical piece of information that didn't really help me make my kind of buying decision or kind of event production decision. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think sometimes it's a smoke screen. Uh, our proposals are written from the perspective of the layperson, uh, and uh, while we have to quantify for procurement purposes and for comparative analysis purposes, how many of this or that we're bringing, we're very much less focused on what the ingredients are um, than we are on how wonderful the, the cake is going to taste once we mix all that together for you. So I completely agree, and I think that people, you know, that think that an inventory list is a response to an RFP, um, and and hopefully, and in the better RFP environments. We have the opportunity to do exactly this. We can get to know each other. We can talk about the business objectives. We can talk about our solution for some of the challenges and the the measurement points. And we can know quickly um, as you know humans if we're the right fit. Uh, and then obviously the procurement piece comes in and they need to, you know, how much is this volt and this nut? And I respect that. We have those people here too. Um, but it's to your point, it is not the seek that is not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is the energy and the magic that exists between the craftspeople and how well when those lights do go down and the show caller says that magic word go, how well does it go? And where does it go? And where are we going to go together? And um, that's the magic of showbiz. And that's very much uh, what we strive for and best practice wise. I, I'm happy to hear you say that. I wanted to talk a little bit about cutting edge. Uh, I think a lot of um, technology, a lot of production companies talk about this idea of, of being bold and being cutting edge and delivering, you know, these kind of ultimate um, wizardries on stage or whatever you will. Where does that come into this, right? Like, because I think a lot of what you've mentioned earlier was also, hey, we don't necessarily need to have the most powerful light in the world. What we need to do is tell a great story and kind of bring it all together. How do you how do you kind of balance that out? Where, where do you need to be cutting edge, and where do you actually, where is that not important? Yeah, I love that question, and it's something that we, on both sides of our word show and business, we have to analyze and and review annually. I'm leaving, you know, now for a trade show tomorrow, where we'll buy a lot of our technology, or today actually after this. Um, it, it's a very interesting, and I believe that's part of the journey as well. As you you start out by thinking that the identity of your show technology company is the technology word comes first. So we're a technology show company, or are you a show technology company? Uh, we believe in the latter of those things. We believe the technology needs to create those shows and that we need to find the most efficient and lowest risk way to deliver on those storytelling goals necessary. So that being said, with regards to technology, we have the latest, greatest stuff um, because it's uh, typically it's a, it's an efficacy um, environment for us. We're not going to necessarily buy it the day it comes out because we think that's risky. We think version one of the new car that comes out might not be bug free. We think the latest piece of this technology or that technology, if it's not tested, tried and true, we don't want our customers being that beta test site. Uh, that being said, once it's identified, its value in the industry is identified, we need to have it to be as efficient and, again, efficacious as we can be in delivering low risk and high impact environments. Ultimately, what corporate customers need is a need to know that their communications objectives are being met 
and that they're being and that they're not exposing their leadership teams to um, any adverse environments, you know, both obviously politically, which we can't control, but technologically as well. So things have to sound good, look good. The fiscal investment for these publicly traded companies, which is available for review, needs to be sound and solid. And, and as such, that's what we depend on technology for. If, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the if we can take one LED engine uh, lighting fixture and create colors and illumination for what used to take two or three fixtures in the incandescent space. We've saved energy, trucking, labor. Um, we have much higher degrees of or lower waste with regards to incandescent uh, lamps and, and waste products. Um, so we're looking for those types of investments in technology, uh, smaller, brighter, faster, um, they're typically more more expensive, but they typically pan out to be better investments for our clients because um, they are more efficient in terms of less use of truck space. We can eliminate a truck. We can eliminate a day of load in. Sometimes we can do that job faster. Same thing in the sound space, you know, smaller, more um Controllable sound sources allow for us to sonically um, populate a space in a way that, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago was just not as possible. We can literally paint um, people and their ears in the sonic space the way that we used to do lighting design uh, through heat mapping and steering softwares and things of that nature. Um, and that's a big problem. And sometimes you don't get the right venue. Sometimes you're in the you're in the barn, you're in the shed, it's super echoey. And um, those are not conducive to clear storytelling. They're distracting. They're not, they don't make people comfortable. And uh, so we're looking for technology that's going to specifically solve something. Um, the wow factor piece of it, we certainly love that too. So we have all the gadgets and gadgets here too, that when it is time to hit the wow button, there's something clever, um, that we, we have to pull out oftentimes though, um, we have to be careful not to have that be single purpose. You think in terms of firework, once you light it off, it blows up, it made pretty pictures and then it's done forever. We try not to, and we're not a pyro company, so I don't, can't speak to that specifically. And I love fireworks, um, but we try to find the energy around that wow factor element through the choreography of music and light. We like scent projections. We like automation. We like movement. We like kinesis. We like um, putting the audience in perspective relative to our scenic design skill sets that, um, or unexpected and and therefore become unforgettable because you're not just another rectangle in a rectangle with somebody pushing a clicker projecting rectangles. Um, that's not what we want. So we use technology to try to convince people to get into the round, to be let the audience be behind you a bit. Let's get a little uncomfortable in terms of the new camera technology. Let's use automation in the camera space and some new switching technology to be more competitive with these music festivals and these other forms of entertainment. Let's let's be artful, inventive as well in those spaces too. I completely agree. I think that that's an excellent approach. So I want to start kind of wrapping up, but I want to go big picture first. Um, and are you seeing, or do you, have any specific kind of big picture challenges that you're, you're thinking in this sort of corporate event space uh, are laying up ahead uh, that we should get ready for? From a technology standpoint or an industry standpoint, what, what is the core of that one? Well, I'd like you to take it wherever you want to take, because I think it's important to look at this from the show side, you know, the, the technology, what is what is dangers or what's what what are challenges in putting on you know the proper storytelling like you want to do but also on the business side are you seeing things coming up that you think might be challenges i think from a technology infrastructural standpoint the show technology base is doing very well because there's a lot of pressure on us to do things quicker faster smaller um, cost effectively high impact and be low waste. We've talked about that for a while. And I, I like where the industry is going. They're reacting well to our demands as their consumers. I think as I look at this business and think about its next 30 year journey, you know, under myself and others, um, it's going to come down to a balance between why we gather. Why does a corporate customer or a private customer, why, why do we meet? What is the purpose of coming together and why is it good business? The balance that's created by those things in terms of room night blocks versus how much time you get in the meeting space versus, you know, load in time, rehearsal time, the things that make, you know, the core 
purpose, you know, you think in terms of the word the Europeans use Congress, right, to, to come together. The core purpose is typically the messaging from leadership and the exposure to leadership that happens in those general sessions. That might be a little myopic, but if you just look at what is key to every conference, uh, it's that we're all together for a high level message for a certain amount of time. Um, we don't always see the balance there between the people that have the event spaces that are available and the needs that are the need to be met from that um, plenary session, if you will, or that general session, that main tent. So I think that we as a planning community need to better support the agencies and planners and producers on the technology side to educate them through things like this. This is why we do these things is to try to meet new friends and open new dialogues about what is necessary for us to have the meeting that's as cool as those guys had. How did they do it and why can't we do it? Well, we have those conversations all the time. We literally get RFPs that say, we want to be like X. Um, we're inspired by X. Um, how can you get us there? And the answer to that oftentimes has nothing to do with show technology. It has to do with good listening, creative design, um, and enough resources to do our job well. Time in the space, um, controllable spaces. Can we get good blackouts? Can we control light level sound? Are we distracted by the client next door? Um, are we smelling lunch just after breakfast? So people, you know, cause it's coming out of the kitchens. It really has to do with the overall ecosystem. And I know it's a little bit of, you know, panacea for me to wish that all of these things are always perfect. And I know it's not easy and I know that's not the case, but I think we're, we're not, we're misaligned a little bit. I think the planning community and this, the things that happen between when a meeting is confirmed and between when those house lights fade and the, and the show starts um, is we can do better as a community to communicate with each other and to support each other's crafts, if you will, in such a way that our make our needs known and understand the challenges of the venue's needs and the planning community's needs to make sure that um, the journey through that time between confirmation and execution is well used and, and is collaborative. Uh, and I, I think that that's where, as an industry, there's a tremendous amount of waste. I think there's choices about, yeah, let's do the general session in the exhibit hall. Yeah, and we'll put the food and beverage, you know, in the in the meeting room. Okay, well, there's a bunch of carpet. There's a bunch of lights that don't work for that. So there's extra house lighting, labor, there's power chargers, there's different union environments that um, we're um, needing to make sure we support in, in a proper way. Um, so sometimes we're looking at decisions from an uh, organizational dynamic that either we don't understand, which is very, very possible, or that if we work together, we could help better align early on and make sure that the client's overall investment in our journey together as craftspeople um, is is rewarding and gives them the return necessary. So very, very long-winded answer, but let's all keep supporting each other um, as we make decisions that certainly affect each other. Let's make sure we all have a say in it. I think that's very fair. Um, it, it It is that kind of uh, challenge, right? Because you're talking about not having a box in a box kind of situation, but those boxes keep things simple, right? They work. And so it, yeah. it's kind of working in different environments and using different venues, but being able to do that in a productive way rather than just sort of putting the meeting in a different environment and then facing all the different challenges. I think that's yeah. to balance that out. We'll take a black box every day. The magic is that is the black because <laughs> when we can take you away from the foyer, we can take you anywhere we want. Um, and we as you know theatrical crafts peoples and planners, again producers, everybody that's involved in messaging, if we can get a blank palette, we can start fresh and take you on that journey. Um, and and you know, we'll take that anytime we can get it. Wanted to ask, uh, before we go to our final question, um, what would your advice be to people that are looking to grow in the industry, in this kind of production side of the industry uh, for you know, young people entering the industry? There's, we have a balance now and we have very, very low turnover here. So I might not be the best answer for that, but uh, as a father- And I'm people, not asking for a, a job or an internship, yeah. but just general advice that, you, that you'd give to, to someone kind of looking it, it, to, to grow. It does come back to that is you have to learn how to do what we do. So you start, it, it is one of the few traditions, uh, or I'm sorry, one of the few industries that still is taught traditionally. You learn from the ground up, you learn by apprenticeships and by shadowing folks and by interning um, at places like this. So my, my biggest piece of advice is while you're pursuing your education, which is very necessary, um, to, from a where does this business fit in the world, 
the what is this business piece of it really comes more from within the craft. So any opportunity you can get to become an intern and to work with and around the people that do this day for day, uh, day after day are, are I think really the the best way to, to accomplish that and be willing to hit walls and be willing to be a little bit embarrassed that you're being asked to do something that you don't know how to do because the payoff for that is you understanding why you're doing it, not what you're doing. And if you can get that causality and that connection between why is it that I'm being asked to do this, you're going to remember how to do it next time and add value to the team by doing so. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And uh, a lot of young people would, would appreciate that advice. Uh, Jonathan, awesome talking to you. Thank you for sharing all that. Wanted to come to our final question, which is for you to recommend someone that should be uh, a next guest on the Skip Meetings podcast. So we've talked a lot today about who draws the story from non-storytellers such that we have the core of what we need to dimensionalize those stories. And um, I'd like to recommend uh, one of my colleagues, Matt Warren. Um, so Matt has a uh, uh, an agency called MWP and has worked on a variety of different scale programs doing exactly that. He and his team create media and create storytelling um, in such a way that is very, very well executable by folks like us. He speaks our language well, and he speaks client speak and planner speak, and he's a wonderful kind of glue um, to put between those things. I think he'd be a tremendous asset and you know, can make the introduction as well. Perfect. Appreciate that, Jonathan. It's always good to connect with different parts of the industry and different people uh, in this way. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, for everybody listening, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Jonathan, I wish you lots of success. I know you're out to go and buy some brand new equipment, so hopefully you'll get, come back with some great tools and you'll tell us all about it soon. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me today.